I'm going to switch over. Today we have our CPD event, which we are organizing with the SLL. And we have a speaker and guest speaker attending today, uh, David, who is one of the committee members. David is a principal at Atkins and is also a fellow of CPC and also a fellow of the SLF, I believe. Uh, he will be presenting the first half of the presentation, which will focus on the legal framework of rain uh, lighting. And the second half of it will be delivered by Andrew, who is a past president of SLL, as well as being a partner at Rich Consulting. And then Andrew will focus on dark skies, I believe. And then we'll take it from there. So David, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Hakeem. Okay, thank you, Hakeem. And yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to be looking at lighting and the law. Uh, the legislation around lighting is getting a little bit more complex, but it has always been there in the background, whether we uh, acknowledged it or not. So I hope this is a revision and not an education. So we're going to be looking at the Health and Safety at Work Act, building regulations, planning approval, the new Building Safety Act, and a little bit on intrusive lighting before I hand over to Andrew to give the, full, the main presentation. So the, the Health and Safety at Work Act affects every single building in this country and areas anywhere where you might have a job of work. So what does how do you actually meet the standards of that? Or well, you have, as an ACOP or the Health and Safety at Work Act, the workplace regulations. And the workplace regulations say, every workplace shall have sufficient and suitable lighting. Doesn't say 500 lux, doesn't say uniformity, doesn't tell you about a maintenance factor. That's what it is. So these are your objectives as a professional lighting designer to meet, to satisfy the law, to have sufficient and suitable lighting. And it's the same for emergency lighting. It doesn't say that you should follow BS 5266. It doesn't say anything about that. So you have to think about what is actually there. It is no good saying in a court of law, well, I, my Lord, I met BS5266, but I didn't know that the guy was working on a lathe and it was a very big lathe and it was going to be rotating for uh, 10 minutes after the lighting went off. That doesn't get you out of it. It must be suitable and sufficient for that. So you have to actually, oh, you've got the wrong slide. Yeah, okay. So, you won't find the lighting levels in the health, the actual bill. You won't even find them in the workplace regulations. Workplace regulations, again, tell you the general things to do it. They're written in a form of the regulation, the ACOP, and the guidance. And the guidance normally refers you to other documents like the BSs and the SLL handbook, the SLL code, lighting guides, and things like that. In the things, and you're supposed to, as a professional, use these documents to come to the lighting levels, the design that is appropriate and suitable as per the regulation. So it is up to the designer to really understand what the client's needs are and to actually ask the client, What lighting do you need? Not to, does, what does it say in BSEN 12464? What are you actually doing in the space? How are you working in the space? What are you actually doing? They won't know what the appropriate and suitable lighting it is. It's your job to actually tell them that. Okay, next one, the building regulations. Two parts to think about. Part B, emergency lighting predominantly, fire safety, all the things that you require for again. And again, there is no levels quoted in here really. There's a table, but it refers you to the BSs and to SLLLG12 to actually 
think about that. And it also, the BS refers to the emergency lighting risk assessment, which should be completed by the client or the designer to understand how to do the emergency lighting. Coming to part L, we have lots of time now put into carbon emissions and reducing to get to net zero. Well, at the moment, we can see that the luminaire efficiencies, 95 luminaire lumens per watt. I've just done a job recently where the luminaires specified were 145 luminaire lumens per watt. And that was for an office. So these figures are not difficult to achieve. In fact, we should actually be doing better these standards. These are minimums that we should be doing. And we should actually be going to actually improve on that. And in my view, we should also be using Lenny, which is mentioned here in part L. And the um, SIPC and SLL are writing a new guide to Lenny and producing a digital tool so people can find Lenny easier to use. And my colleague Christina Allison is leading that process. So we hope to see that in the next year. Lighting controls are important. So many times we see lighting controls which are not actually commissioned correctly. And if you see, read the part of the building regs, it refers you to BRE 498, which it gives you good guidance as to what the savings should be from a, a lighting control and how to commission the lighting control. And you can also refer to the LG, it's 14 for lighting controls. Yes, I can't remember that. Also commissioning guide L. And commissioning guide L as well, yeah. So planning approval. I do a lot of work for councils as their subject matter expert. And planning approvals is part of that. So I see applications by project teams to, to me as the, can, uh, as the representative to the council. And I am shocked at the standards that come in in a lot of cases, the amount of times of toing and froing there. And obtrusive lighting is particularly bad. We need to actually improve our delivery of obtrusive lighting assessments there. Sunlight and overshadowing, that's really important. And in the net zero world, daylight it's king. We should be ma maximising our daylight and achieving our thermal performance for glazing and the overall fabric of the building. They are not mutually exclusive. They must be built up together and worked in an optimal manner. That's what's going to give you the really low energy, high performance buildings. And we have lots of effects now for solar glare, effects from photovoltaic farms where they affect aircraft and they affect um, train drivers and things like that. So there's a lots of studies which are now about solar glare particularly. And again, there is guidance from the BRE on solar glare. Lighting effects on flora and fauna. We, we all know that bats are particularly sensitive to light and it affects how they travel and what species are available to them. So we need to think particularly about that as well. And there are some particular areas that are um, covered by the Wild, Wildlife and Countryside Act. Building safety bill. I'm not going to uh, talk much about this, but it's important to understand emergency lighting is part of the building safety bill and it is particularly about the delivery of how you design and show the passage of the design through the various gateways to the handover of the building. And it, it, we can't have any more the o &M manuals arriving nine months, 18 months later than when the building is open. You will not be able to open the building without having the o &M manuals and the as fitted drawings and the emergency lighting certificates, the, the declaration of conformity. Those sorts of things are now going to have to be done. 
So when the contractor says, oh, I can't, I can't spare the time for the commissioning, can we shorten the commissioning period? No, we can't. They've, they're going to have to realise that these things have to be completed before the building can be opened. So I'm just going to, this is a, an introductory slide to what Andrew will be talking about. So with obtrusive light, uh, light, obtrusive light is now a statutory nuisance. It has been since 2005. So it's like excessive noisy neighbours there. So we need to, it's a statutory nuisance. So if the light affects someone, someone's residence, I remember when I was doing a emergency life, a intrusive lighting risk assessment for um, Crossrail, and I found that the contractor had 800 watt metal halide lamps vertically set, shining across the across the tracks into someone's bedroom. The kids couldn't go to sleep and they, they really couldn't do it. So it's not just the normal lighting, it's the construction light, it's temporary lighting as well. We have to be able to control these things in a way that is monitored. And so, so inspection is important, commissioning as well. OK, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew. Thank you, David. Uh, perfect uh, introduction with um, that particular slide. Uh, I'll just share screen. And hopefully that uh, shows up um, for everybody uh, and they can see uh, and hear. OK, um, as I said, thanks so much, David. Uh, perfect introduction. I just want to expand on what David has uh, been talking about there. Uh, and it's just to give a, a, an overview of where we are with obtrusive light and, and dark skies and as we, we like to call it pristine skies um, because dark skies has this connotation of a lack of safety where pristine skies is what we're really after. We're looking to enhance people's lives with good lighting but also look after the pristine skies for everybody's benefit. And I just want to touch on this, this uh, idea of where we are with legislation, standards and guidance, etc., and um, where we're moving to as well and where we may be moving to. Um, and, and a good place to start, if you haven't already um, looked at this document, this is uh, was written by Dan Oakley, who was um, a dark sky ranger with um, South Down uh, National Park, uh, and he wrote towards a dark sky standard. And one of the, 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 it's a great document, but one of the best things I find about it is he collated together um, everything he could find at the time relating to obtrusive light, uh, lighting for the outdoor environment, um, bats, et cetera, et cetera, the environment. Um, and he picked up on the fact that light pollution, obtrusive light was a statutory nuisance. Um, and that sits there as a document that has a, a, a legal standing. But there's a lot of holes in that document as well. For example, uh, you can ignore transport um, infrastructure projects. They, they don't have to count. And there's many other areas which don't count. And also, who's policing this? Um, so if you've got a neighbour who's uh, causing you some uh, light pollution, you, you can maybe talk to them first. If need be, you can start getting serious uh, and taking the matter legally with the local authority. Um, but actually, on the whole, I, I think it's safe to say this isn't really as a subject being policed, which is surprising when you look there. There's about 22 documents that um, Dan pulled together there. Some of those are ILP documents such as uh, Guidance Note 01, which a lot of us use. That's the reduction of obtrusive light. You've got some uh, Society of Light and Lighting documents there, external lighting. You've got British Standards, the EN 12464 documents. You've then got other documents from um, CPRE. You've got documents from International Dark Sky Association, who are now called Dark Sky International. So wherever you see IDA, uh, that is also now um, DSI. And, and really what this is telling us that there is a wealth of information out there. There's a huge amount of information that, that we can call upon. Um, and therefore, why are we in this situation that, that perhaps 
um, lighting isn't being delivered as well as it should be um, and, and, and what do we do about it? And in addition to all of these, what you would consider more formal documents, which talk about advertising and planning guidance and EIAs, et cetera, uh, you also have project specific guidance um, starting to be developed now. And in fact, London also then has a, a document and there are other areas and councils of the country um, who have their own documentation about dark skies and obtrusive light. Um, and they're all very useful. This one in particular was written for a project in the Red Sea uh, area, and it's very relevant to making sure people don't overlight an area which has a very light surface, i.e. light coloured sand, because um, one lux onto light coloured sand enables you to see as much as 10 lux or more onto tarmac. So this document was very much focused on the beach areas, the desert areas, etc., cetera, um, and making sure that people took into account local conditions. And there's lots of these documents around. And, and with so many documents, I suspect if there were 22 documents in 2021, I suspect there are 40 documents now. In fact, um, in November, the European Union published a document. We've also got the Darkness Manifesto, which I think came out of Lancaster University and various of the Roland Manifesto and the Roland Conference, in fact. Um, and uh, also the Light and Building in Dubai had an entire session on, on pristine sky. So this subject is, is really out there, but... Um, and I think we'll see later on, it's not something that's um, being delivered very well. A couple of years ago, we had an all party parliamentary group come together dedicated to dark skies. And after a short, a fairly short period of time, they produced um, uh, their um, policy uh, documents. Um, they, they, they developed 10 policies of how they would like to see this subject move forward. And I'm not going to read through all of that. Um, if, if anything, focus on the italic text on, on the right hand side there. And their policies one to three um, very much recognised that um, they needed to update the existing framework and the, and the, and the uh, policies uh, such as um, uh, the uh, Clean uh, Neighbourhood Act because there were too many holes, there were too many ways people could get around there. So their first three policies were all about um, strengthening the, the legal framework. Then policies four to seven were very much about taking on board the incredible knowledge and information that exists within the Society of Light and Light and the Institution of Light and Professionals and other professional bodies in order to, to, to push forward um, the knowledge they have, the design knowledge, the, the ideas they have, this, this whole notion of the blue component of light that we need to reduce. And having pushed that forward and marketed that information, they would be in a much better position with the stronger legal framework to be able to start punishing non-compliance and enforcing the regulations. So we first got to educate people and the information is there to do that. But we then have to have the legal framework in place um, that we can make people um, actually comply with the uh, educational information we've given them. The final policies, eight to ten, were very much uh, uh, about um, encouraging uh, people to adopt the standards, uh, encouraging people to take on board uh, the information that they were being given, almost incentivize them. Um, so look out for those people who are doing a good job um, and, and either through funding or through additional personnel resource, uh, ensure that they have um, everything they need to deliver good quality lighting. So it was a really powerful document when it came out at its time. It was a big step forward for the industry that you had this all party parliamentary group coming together with a really clear defined set of uh, policies for, for us all to look at. Unfortunately, then it, it's kind of just hovered Nothing's moved forward um, with the APPG. If anything, it's back to the industry to take that on and try and move that forward. But it's very difficult. Um, we, ne we, need, we need government, we need councils, local authorities to move with us. Um, I think we want to move at one pace. Unfortunately, not everyone can move at that pace. But something else that has happened, and I think this was around May to June last year, there was um, a evidence gathering session in the House of Lords, which was looking at the health and well-being impact of noise and light. Um, and as the Society of Light and Lighting and Institution of Lighting Professionals and many, many other bodies were invited to give evidence to the House of Lords, um, 
and and from that and, and it was a very knowledgeable certainly the, the ones i saw were very knowledgeable sessions in terms of um the information being given and the questions from the from the lords in terms of their understanding of the subject and from that they provided um the the government with 22 recommendations you can get all of these documents uh, online um if you go to house lords and type in um light and noise health and well-being uh, evidence session you'll find it quite quickly um, they provided 22 recommendations to the government unfortunately uh, the government wrote a fairly short reply back um, and in in the terms of lighting they basically said there's insufficient research regarding the impact of light on health uh, which was incredibly disappointing when you looked at how much evidence had been gathered um, by the House of Lords and where that evidence had come from. Dark Sky International came over from America to give evidence and they've been doing this for 30 plus years that you know they really are the founders of this uh, of this movement. Um, and so it's really difficult, uh, disappointing. Uh, in particular, the House of Lords themselves had said there's there's lots of pockets of information. There's clearly an impact, but perhaps the first thing is to focus that focus the energy onto some more distinct and specific um, areas. So having identified that and then provided um, advice and recommendations, it's difficult, disappointing to see that uh, the government simply said, well, there's insufficient research. Uh, fortunately, Baroness Brown was uh, um, rightly as upset as the rest of us, and she's written back to express the concerns uh, the House of Lords have and ask the government to reconsider their response and come back with with more detail. Um, and we really do need this conversation at this level uh, in order for all of the knowledge we have as lighting professionals to be taken forward. And so we await what's going to happen there. In the background, the community of lighting bodies um, are pulling some of that evidence together to try and make it as easy as possible um, for the House of Lords to go back to the government and say, look, we have a body of people, a professional body of people, and this is the evidence you think is missing and it's not missing. So there's work to be done there um, and we very much need it to be done uh, if we are to see this whole idea of obtrusive light not being something that's dealt with um, when there's a, a difficult site or some wildlife or when somebody raises a concern, but actually we need this to simply become part and parcel of what we do as lighting professionals on every job. And I think the will of the lighting community is there and I think the will of a lot of developers and, and clients is there, but there isn't the legislation and policies to back it up and therefore quite often um, it's uh, it gets left to one side. So just thinking about the process then, what, what, what do we mean when we talk about obtrusive light? Well, there are four different ways um, we find ourselves involved in um, obtrusive light projects and dark sky projects. The first and the most simplest is where you might have an office building being built in a city, it's next to another office building. You're not going to impact on wildlife, you're not going to impact on residential buildings. And therefore, the planners might simply ask you to provide an access statement or they might ask you to provide two or three pages to describe how are you going to deliver the lighting? What what are your principles? Give us a mood board of images. Give us some some facts uh, about how you will go about it. Will all the lights aim downwards, etc.? Just give us some a, a narrative, if you like. And what they tend to come back with at that point is that they'll approve the building for planning with the condition that you undertake calculations at the time that you're doing the detailed uh, level of information, production information. So it's quite a quick process to get uh, uh, planning recognition. The next stage is where you then might have, um, you, your building might potentially spill light onto a residential building or you might be potentially spilling light onto um, a forest or a hedgerow or uh, towards a river. And that's where the planners may uh, be a little bit more concerned. And quite often we find they quote the Institution of Lighting Professionals GNO1 document, which is all about um, Provide, it provides you with details on the spill light you can emit, the sky glow you can emit, um, the facade luminance you can have, 
all related to the type of environment in which you sit. So are you in a national park or are you in a city? And it gives you different criteria depending uh, where you are. And sometimes there's a need for a site survey, sometimes there isn't. But the thing that they are looking for is a lux plot, a calculation of your light and design um, and how and how that actually uh, results in in terms of the light spill around the area. The critical the critical item here is is when to do that work. If you do that work too soon, and then you go through a whole series of changes, the site changes slightly, paths, roads, entrances change. You are going to have to redo that work and submit again. Or if you do it too soon and some, a contractor comes on board, the light fittings change, you are going to have to redo that calculation and submit that again. So it's you've got to be careful with this. Um, it's about doing this work at the right time uh, in order to be efficient for yourself and, and for the client. The next level we then find is if you, if you have a, a project, you might be building uh, on a greenfield site, you might be adjacent to, directly adjacent to a river or an area of special scientific interest, and the planners are already aware um, that, that, that what you are doing is, is far more sensitive. And this is when you might become involved in a light and impact assessment as part of an overall environmental impact assessment. Now, some of the work you undertake for this might actually be the same as what we've just talked about uh, when you undertake a GN01 um, assessment. But what you will find here is you first have to agree what is scoped in and scoped out of, of uh, the, the light and impact assessment or the environmental impact assessment. Sometimes you can look at a site and say, well, there are 200 street lights on that site. Now we are putting 22 street lights back. The optics at the moment are open bowl fittings with sun lamps. We are putting in LEDs which are fully housed within the fitting and only aim downwards. Actually, we're going to have much less impact. We can scope out the lighting from the environmental impact assessments. And there might be other factors in there as well in terms of the wildlife that surrounds the area and residents who surround the area. Or sometimes you might find, and we have a project at the moment in Sirencester, where it's a greenfield site and not only are we having to take into account the changes that will be made to our site, we've got to take into account the changes that will be made over the road because the cumulative effect of two develop, the developments happening on greenfield sites will bring about an impact. And so therefore, you're at a, a higher level with an EIA compared to the previous um, process where it, it's becoming more legal, it's becoming more formal. You're starting to talk about the level of impact and whether it's significant and is it uh, a significant impact, moderate impact, is it a negligible impact? And, and it's much more serious and the language is written in a much more formal way compared to facts and figures um, from the GNO1 assessment. And dark sky design, I haven't put it at the end there necessarily because it's the most onerous as such, but it, it is another level again in that it is slightly different. What you're starting to look at there is not necessarily light spill from the site or how bright your facade is. You're not looking at the ground or the facade or what's happening on somebody's window. Actually, with dark sky design, you're looking at what's happening to the sky. It's all about how you're protecting or restoring the night sky. So are you making the quality of the night sky better or are you actually just protecting what is there? Um, and that's very much what uh, dark sky design is all about. Now, there are some elements of dark sky design that has made its way into GNO1, and I'll come on to that um, now. Just expanding on that process um, that we talked about. So this is very much a process that we would follow uh, for undertaking a, a, an ILP GNO1 study. And I, I'm not going to talk through everything that's on, on those uh, four columns there. I'll just pick out some certain things. But right at the front end, it's very much about establishing what's known as the environmental zone. So in many ways, the local authority should tell you. So, for example, the site in Sirencester we have, um, we're just outside the city, but we are, you know, so we're quite close, but we are on a greenfield site. Um, so you, 
you would expect them to tell you that's an E1 or an E2 area. We haven't had that information. So we've had to make that assessment, put that into our report and, and describe what that is. And just to clarify on that, an E0 would be a national park, E4 would be a city centre, and then you've got one, two and three sitting in though between E0 and E4. So you first thing to do is understand what that environmental zone is and have that agreed with the local authority if possible, or make it very clear very early on what assumption you are making. That environmental zone will then tell you um, the criteria that you're working towards in terms of the light spill in, in which direction and, and how much, etc. The next thing to do, and, and this is best done visiting site, you, you can try and use Google Earth, you can try and use maps, you can try and use other people's views who have been to site, but get into site, seeing the space during the day and during the evening and understanding the key receptors. Is the key receptor the hedgerow? Is it somebody's window? And it's only when you get there and you see the existing lights and you look at which ones are being taken down, what's going to be put back. It's only when you have that knowledge that you can start to truly understand where the key receptors are. And also what are the adjacencies, as we mentioned before, if another development is also going up at the same time or going, going to be built shortly after yours, you've got to take that on board. And although you might have less information about it, you've got to provide a narrative of how your development and an adjacent development together are going to actually impact uh, in the area. After the research, the next section is very much the survey, understanding the baseline, light levels, lux readings, taking photographs, all the usual things that you would do. But something that has been added to the latest version of GN01 is this idea of SQM readings, sky quality measurements. Uh, the light meters that for doing this are, are fairly cost effective. They're not too expensive. The data logger type are a little more expensive if you want to be positioning a, a meter overnight or for a few days to understand what's happening. Otherwise, it's very much a handheld device. Be a little bit careful about where you're aiming it, making sure it's level, taking plenty of readings so you're not just relying on one reading as you've got the meter out of your pocket. Um, but it is starting to get people used to this idea of an SQM reading. Now, it's a logarithmic scale, so going from a reading of 15 to 21 is actually a huge difference. It's a significant difference. I haven't included uh, much uh, information on SQMs in this uh, uh, talk. There's another talk uh, I've done recently that uh, I can direct you to for that. Um, but the idea with the Dark Sky International is that anything over 21.2 effectively means that you are in an area that they would consider a pristine sky. Um, so so you've, if you're in an area of 21.2 and you're adding light into that area, you shouldn't be doing so in a way that reduces the SQM reading below 21.2. So that's something new to look out for as well as your, your Lux readings. The next part is design. And I think this is where sometimes, and you were talking about this before, David, um, don't don't be too quick to to dive into a book and look at the lighting levels. I must have 10 lux here. I must have 10 lux there. Just start to think about what are people actually doing in different areas? Can we provide people with a safe route at nine o'clock at night and turn the other lights off? So during peak time, let's say from four till seven, all the paths might be lit. But after seven o'clock, can we just make sure we provide people with one safe route, turn everything else off? Let's start looking at applicable lighting levels because if, if the lights are off or if they're well controlled so they're only on when people are there that's the best way to protect the night sky that's the best way to look after wildlife etc so um, let's not dive in put 10 looks on every path more five looks on every path let's start thinking about that more cleverly and more intelligently and then the report and I'll, I'll come on to uh, uh, a quick example of, of how this can be reported so how how do you then report that information it does it changes for every type uh, two or three pages for that first process we talked about dark sky um, uh, applications might take you anything from 50 to 500 pages depending on the size of your site uh, but a gn01 um, document could be a short report with a drawing or if you if it depends on the type of building you might get the whole thing onto a drawing Again, though, the, the key thing being make sure those receptors are clearly marked and make sure the lighting levels at those receptors are, are clearly marked up as well. 
So coming on to that, and I, I do apologize, it's slightly small. So the image on the left hand side there, that is um, the entire building with all of the external lighting all marked up onto one drawing. Uh, the bottom left there, we've got a whole series of notes that tell you about the light in the installation, the aiming angles, uh, etc. The centre table um, talks about this is the criteria, uh, and I've, I've expanded that on the bottom right hand side. This is the criteria for environmental zone E3, and this is how we've met that in all of these locations. We've made it really clear for the authority to say they should be less than 10 pre curfew. They are less than 10 pre curfew. They've told me they've passed. I'm going to sign this off. We've, we make it as simple as possible. Um, and then the image, uh, the table on the, the far right on that left image is just the fit in details. So they want to know the lumen output, the color temperature, et cetera. Again, making it as simple as possible that they can give it a and you can just see, see, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but you can just see here, we've marked up the key receptors around the site. So as well as looking at this one lux line and how far this one lux line is, is traveling, we've also marked up where we might have other people's windows or the site boundary and we're taking vertical measurements as well. Um, this was a little interesting piece here and it's all caused by a fence in this location here. So you initially look at it and something's gone wrong with the calculation, but uh, it hasn't. It's uh, it, it's very much uh, intended to be there. So making it as clear as possible, having all of the information there um, for the local authority to look at it and say, you've ticked all the boxes, um, we, we'll help you with your planning application process. So uh, a few images of potential solutions here. And, and what we find is nothing's difficult. Um, and and also we find people, once you've explained why, they are quite happy to, to just make subtle changes to installations. So uh, a good example here, quite often you have advertising hoardings um, and the, the flood light in, is, is in the ground facing upwards and just making sure the lights at the top facing down. But more than that, just to have uh, a little shielded detail uh, across the front uh, of um, those lights, just so you're not looking at the light source. And that suddenly makes your eye see the darkness of the night sky because you're not looking at that pinch point uh, that you get when uh, when you're looking at a light source. Um, there does happen to be a, a street light in the background there, which doesn't help, but, uh, but it, it does look great. And what was ideal there is, we knew the light would be sufficient to also then light that path. And so we've got two things in one there. We've lit the information well, and the reflected light is lighting that route that takes you um, through the old town in Alula in Saudi Arabia. We, in fact, funnily enough, Dave, we were just talking about uh, the plethora of festoon lighting. Festoon lighting is everywhere, and it's a real bugbear for me, but you can just wrap something around it. It could be semi-translucent, but you are, if, even if it's semi-translucent, you're at least taking a good percentage of the light away from being emitted into the night sky. Again, in Alula, they'd wrap this so that the majority of the light was coming down with just a small glow uh, through, the, uh, through the reed structure of the shade just to give it some interest. Uh, a project we did many, many years ago. There are very, very few lights. There are no poles in the car park. It's all low level lighting. Um, and the lights that are under the canopy are hidden into the canopy, only providing down lighting. And this was very much that scenario where we um, focused on understanding when will the building be open? how often will people be using the building in winter up to what time and then only providing a lighting scheme that kept them safe for that period and after that the lights go off and that's the best way to protect um, the environment we had blinds on the hostel at the far end there um, such that at night time those came down and there's actually a big glazed area just to the right hand side for the cafe and again they had automatic blinds coming down so as not to emit the internal cafe light out into the night sky. Uh, this is a hotel uh, in Saudi Arabia and it, it's interesting these are initially a, a 
good idea and seem a good idea in terms of keeping the light level low to the ground, simply giving people a marker light as to where to go. But we did flag up at the time, depending on the undulation of the light in the area, you might find that there's certain areas you're staring straight at these lights. And lo and behold, when we uh, went to visit site, there's a couple of areas where you are staring straight at these lights. So it's not just about choosing the right light fitting, it's about using it in the right place, in the right way. And sometimes you have to just come away from an idea uh, and move on to uh, a different uh, a different concept. A simple one uh, we're looking at um, in uh, Oldham. Uh, it's the gallery, and it, the middle image is how it looked or how it did look uh, until the construction started. Um, how it looked when it was floodlit, and the image on the right hand side, the render, is how it will look uh, when they finish it uh, towards the end of this year. Picking out details, being very careful with where the fittings are positioned, and just being more respectful. Um, and we have got some calculations which we'll release in due course as to how much. Um, light, less light has been emitted. And um, almost finally, uh, this is very much about controls. And I mentioned this before that you, you can have different levels of light um, throughout the night. It's not just about having a busy facade all night long. If a place is busy with pedestrians, by all means, let's light that facade, that's fine. But as that pedestrian traffic starts to die down, let's start to tone down the facade light and let's start to be more specific until we get to such a point that we only have the functional lighting on. <clears throat> so if somebody needs to get home, if somebody needs to get in the building, they can do so. And this is a very simple, quick fix in terms of light pollution. And to finish on a high, um, I you know, all of us, we've got a massive job on our hands because for every project you fix, for every time you work on a project where you've improved an area, somebody comes along um, and just puts up some floodlights. You were talking about it before, David. Floodlights aiming sideways. This is Manchester Piccadilly Station um, and the light is just being emitted straight across that car park. It's, uh, it really is horrendous um, and unnecessary. Uh, we were asked to, this is Manchester again, the Hacienda, what used to be the Hacienda nightclub is between this red brick building and the white bridge that you see there. And we were asked to go and have a look at whether the hotel behind the bridge would have an impact on the residents who now live in the Hacienda. And of course, when we got there, what we actually saw was this large digital sign, uh, absolutely blasting light all over the place. And when that sign was predominantly white, there was 30 lux of light onto the residents residential bedroom windows of the Hacienda. It was horrendous. Um, and, you know, of course, as the adverts changed, so did the entire environment and the ambience of that part of, of Manchester. So it's shocking. So and we have a lot of these everywhere. Um, and people don't even need to spend a lot to destroy a space. Um, uh, if you know these people who own this, obviously don't say anything, but you know, why? Why have we got those two up lights, you know, half casting a bit of a light on the corner of a window and not quite lighting the whole facade? You know, someone's just put up two lights. And like I said, we, you know, we, we really do have a job for life if we're trying to deal with light pollution, because as soon as you fix one thing, something else pops up. And uh, we've got hundreds of images, as I'm sure everyone has. So the sooner we have more education for the general public, not just lighting professionals. And the sooner we have the legislation to back that up so that we could deal with this, um, the better it has to be. Uh, and if I leave you with just one thing, um, something we said a while ago, um, there's absolutely no reason now why you should have a dark skies project or a non dark skies project. There's no reason why you should be focusing on obtrusive light on some projects and not on others. They should all be about uh, making sure you're not polluting the night sky and where we need to get to. It's correct that we should be protecting the night sky in national parks, in dark areas. But we should now also be trying to restore the night sky in our city centres, towns and villages, etc. Thank you very much. David, over to you. Yeah, Thank you very much for that, uh, Andrew and David.
Uh, I'll just go through very quickly in the chat to make sure there's no questions there. None in the chat at the moment. In the room, have you got any questions for either David or Andrew? Andrew, um, I'm just aware that uh, there's one aspect that you didn't cover, and that's the luminance of luminaires. So many times, you know, a badly aimed luminaire, it might well be right the thing, just causes this problem. It's like in photography when we talk about the, the, the uh, digital sensor can't handle the latitude, and we get the blinking highlights, things in our photographs. There. So, uh, you know, what I see is no one doing the luminance calculations to the receptors. It really is, for me, an absolute must because it's that which is for what people notice the most. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because uh, that was introduced. That whole area calculation, the the surface area of your light source calculation, was introduced. I think in the latest um, uh, GNO one document. And, and you're correct. It's it's something we're not seeing that we're being asked for. Um, so it is very much about only when you you provide it. Um, we we are um, always advocating, as I'm sure everyone else is, um, more light fittings and each one with a smaller intensity, a lower intensity. Uh, and, and that's the way we, we're finding that we're dealing with things um, and, and creating better environments. If you have more light sources, but each one is less intense, you're going to create a softer, more comfortable environment than having uh, one light source that, that's trying to do everything everything as, as you saw with Piccadilly Station, big floodlights trying to, I think they were trying to light 40 metres across that car park, which they were doing very successfully, but they were also lighting the building opposite beyond the car park and buildings beyond that uh, building. Um, so you're right, uh, something we are doing a lot of and manufacturers have responded well is we are now getting external light fittings with um, locks installed an aluminium lock so you've got to get an aluminium key allen key there uh, and actually lock it into place um, and that's helping that said, um, I, I have been back to some sites and people have literally just pulled the fit into aim it where they feel it should be. Um, so, yes, we can aim fittings. Yes, we can do the calculations and tell the planners, but there has to then be some policing by the operator to say, that's just not right. That's not how it should be. Let's check this once a year. Is everything aimed where it should be? But it's a good point. It's not something we're being asked for it's only something that we're doing when we feel it needs to be done for that particular project i mean i think leds will help us enormously in this time because the maintenance guys won't have to go up there alter the fitting to change the lamp and then forget to re-aim aim it in the right place so the uh, luminaires should say stay aimed where they need to be aimed yeah well and, and that was an interesting policy that the ap APPG put forward was that each luminaire should come with an instruction on where it should and shouldn't be aimed just as an educational process okay you don't want lots of pieces of paper that are going to be in every fitting being thrown away but certainly for your DIY type fittings you know let's just actually start putting uh, I've, I've got a neighbour on this side um, I, hope, I hope they're not watching I've got a neighbour on this side who's uh, they, it just ain't they like our garden more than they like their own garden and yet we've got a neighbour on this side who initially put his light in the traditional way face up and after two days realised our bedroom was benefiting more than his back garden and aimed at himself downwards and I hadn't even said anything or, or, or spoken to him. Um, so, so, you know, education's the, the, the way to go and APPG recognise that, that we can't criticise people too much if we haven't told them what they're doing wrong or how to do it better. I think the other thing is with, with controls, we've now got the ability to do adaptive light and to actually mold, mold the lighting to the time. So your slide showed that very, very well. Uh, but, you know, getting it, when I talk to a lot of clients, we talk about curfews a lot more and actually saying that in a school, that the lighting must be off after nine o'clock, after the adult education. People have gone home. And it must be in controls must do that. So it becomes an actual planning requirement on the project. 
but they, they do bits and the, the security lighting is a different system which is much much lower and much more bulkhead type fittings on, on the walls so they have a level of light there that gives some kind of lighting for the cctv to work with yeah, I, I think you're right. The adaptive lighting is 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 definitely the way to go. An interesting one there, though, is um, for a dark sky. If you want a dark sky park and you want this 21.2 SQM reading, um, what they're not looking for, what Dark Sky International don't want you to do is to say, well, if you come out at midnight, you will definitely be able to see the Milky Way. They don't want you to have this curfew time when suddenly the, the sky is available to you to see. They want you to be able to see that sky. They want you to be able to walk out when it's gone dark, an hour after darkness. They want you to be able to walk out and see that Milky Way. So that's what makes that particular design criteria so much tougher. It's about what's happening as soon as it's dark. What can you see and how dark is it? It's uh, it's a bit tougher than having a curfew. Thank you, Andrew. I, I personally think it's more of a change of culture. Uh, people generally default that the more lighting you have, the better and safer a space is. Which to an extent is not totally true because you just evidence there. With one of the examples, you can actually illuminate a building without actually illuminating the whole space and still have it safe to utilize. I think as part of the exercise you're doing, what could be useful is to try and showcase the cost savings from a utility point of view. People understand the pound sign. And I think the minute we start aligning the two together in terms of controlling the light and also uh, evidencing the cost savings, people will take more interest and notice as well. Uh, fantastic presentation. Well done. I've got one more point to make. Um, I think one of the things that I would like to see now is that uh, more councils take on lighting master plans and actually look at how their city actually looks and what buildings should be lit, what buildings shouldn't be lit. I did a project very early in my career, which was around the Tower of London, and it was the environs report there uh, what how the night scene should look. And I went to Mike Simpson and Phillips as, a, as they were then and asked him, could they turn down the lighting they just put on the, the tower bridge because it was too bright, I get it in re relationship to the tower, because the tower was what people wanted to see, particularly the two together, and one was dominating the other. We've just seen um, the all the bridges being lit there, and the amount of uh, controversy that we've seen inside that, and how, um, I forget the name of the guy now, but uh, was doing it, uh, Leo, uh, the artist who did the Oakland Bridge. You know, uh, they were to told what they could and couldn't do. And the fact is, they were worried about how the, the fish were going to be affected at night as well. We had the same thing at uh, Durham, on the River Weir, at a bat hotel. And that what happened there was that the, the ambient lighting that was already in there was greater than the levels that were required for bats. And we were told we had to meet the bat level. So they said, can't meet the bat levels. But not unless you turn out all these other lights that are there. <laughs> you know, but there doesn't seem to be an appreciation of how this works. But there needs to be more joined up communication, in my view. I, I agree, and I, I think it's great to have all this documentation because it shows the subject is people, everyone is taking it seriously. But I think what where we're now at is let's have a single um, document that covers everything. There's enough knowledge and people out there who could help pull that together. And we have been talking to people, let's just have this single document. And that makes it easy for councils to just point and go, I want that and their job's done. And the easier we make it for people, I think the more we'll see it happen. I think just to add to what David said earlier, maybe what councils need to start doing is taking area view of areas and capturing the level of light intensity and looking at it over a period of time and see whether it's improving or whether it's actually getting worse. That's another way of uh, driving change. 
and and the house lords picked up on that that actually there is no standard way of measuring this and it's not being recorded well when it is being measured so if somebody could pull together that methodology and people started to record it as you say if you saw something getting worse you would do something about it whereas if you don't notice from one year to the next you're probably not going to do anything about it yeah perfect so, point yeah yeah just like the Antarctica if that wasn't being captured everyone would think it's just all talks but because it's been evidence and we can see it being depleted it makes everybody look at it with a more serious uh, uh view and i think that's the only way we can drive the lighting change as well in terms of uh, lighting pollution i mean i think we ought to say we're not being killjoys and we do like good facade lighting we do like to see our buildings of importance lit at night but there are too many buildings which aren't of importance, which are there. I don't know if you remember uh, the scheme for the Hoover building uh, in London. It's on the A40. If you come into London, it's it's probably the best Art Deco facade in the in the country, and it's white. And someone decided to light it with green light, vivid green light, and it it was as this. If something had come from Mars and had arrived in uh, North London, it, it got turned down three in, in, in intensity four times because the people in across the A40 had green ceilings in their bedrooms. Unbelievable. We'll chance for more questions in the, the room, what we're trying. And there's no such thing as a silly question. Every, every question is always valid. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. It was uh, great. Thank you. Thank you. So on this note, I'd like to say a big thank you to David and to Andrew uh, for taking the time out to present to us today. And I also like to thank everyone of you for making the time out to be here in person. And to those online, thank you very much. And we do have some refreshments right at the back. Uh, please help yourself after the uh, event is closed. Uh, to those who are online or who are in the room who are not yet CIPC members, please by all means register. Uh, CIPC.org is our web website address. Also, we've got a LinkedIn page. Uh, it's on County Southwest Region. Please follow us. And that way you get to know about. Uh, more recent or planned events going forward. And also to Fiona for helping out today. Thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for asking. Thank you.